Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. We, uh, uh, we had anticipated more people coming, but it turns out a lot of them are watching us on the internet, and that's probably a little easier for people with traffic. So we're going to get started, and I want to say sincere thanks to all of you for coming. You know, when we, uh, when we have public events here at CSS, we always start with a little safety announcement, and I'm responsible for your safety today. So if anything happens, nothing's going to happen. I want you to know that. But if anything were to happen, I'd ask you to follow me, follow my instructions. We've got exits right on that door and right at that door, and we'll just head out that way. The exit to the street is right out by that door. So we'll go down. If the problem's out in front, we're going to go to the back, and we'll go over to the National Geographic and rendezvous over at, at the courtyard of the National Geographic Association. If the problem's in the back, we're going to go front. We'll go down to St. Matthew's Cathedral. We'll take a head count and make sure everybody's fine. So just, but please follow my instructions if we have to do anything. <clears throat> um, this is a very, very interesting project. I, uh, I probably have a, learned more and been more engaged in this project than than probably anything I've worked on in 15 years here at CSS. It, it brought back a, a memory of a, of, a, of a conversation I had with a, a professor back when I was in university. And, uh, and, he, and he, he created a mental image for me. He said there was, there was an economist, there was a, uh, a medical doctor, there was a sociologist who were all trying to explain the origins of the bubonic plague and the, and the Black Death in Europe in the 11th century. And of course, the epidemiologist said, well, it was about the microorganism that was, that was carried on fleas, fleas were on the rats, and, and it, it caused the disease to spread throughout humanity. Um, <clears throat> the uh, sociologist said, well, but, but this was a time when we saw a massive shift of people from the countryside uh, and moved into cities. And sanitation hadn't evolved, and it allowed the expansion of the vector where people could easily become infected because it was really caused by these sociological conditions. The economist said, no, this was a time when we started to see automation. And people couldn't, you know, in the countryside, and people had to move to the city. So it was really about economic forces. And the purpose of the story was to say that, uh, you know, history has many di dimensions, many dimensions, and they all have validity. None of them singularly tells a complete story. You kind of need to have a perspective on all of them, in a way, to try to understand very complex historical developments. That was a bit in my mind when we had a conversation a year ago with uh, Prime Minister Abe and his advisors, because they were anticipating the uh, anniversary, the 70th anniversary of uh, the end of World War II and knew that it was going to be controversial and they were seeking a perspective that was wider than just their own historical experience. And in, in many ways, every, every one of us had very different histories in the 20th century. <clears throat> and so we agreed to do that. Uh, and with their support, we were able to assemble historians from seven different countries and we, get, we asked them to help understand the sweep of the 20th century. Um, I think what all these historians will say is it started before 1900. You know, in many ways, the forces that shaped the 20th century began two decades, even three decades earlier. We started to see the collapse of the political order that shaped the international environment for 400 years. The Ottoman Empire was collapsing. The Habsburg Empire was collapsing. The Romanov dynasty was falling apart from the inside. Uh, the Qin dynasty was imploding. Um, the, uh, the Spanish Empire collapsed. We, we helped with that. We overthrew them and took their colonies, you know. Uh, the Brits and the French were both imploding, but they hadn't seen it yet. But there were fractures starting to emerge. And in that environment, <clears throat> when the international system was starting to implode, uh, a consciousness of young, active political nationalists started to emerge around the world. And they started to define uh, a history for their own country, uh, seeking to take advantage of the fact there was going to be a power vacuum. That was the start of the 20th century. I'm not going to go further because I'm going to let each of these uh, historians share with you part of that narrative. 
Um, it's very important. None of this, I should say, is meant in any sense to whitewash the terrible history of the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and, and Japan made some very bad mistakes in the path it chose. Uh, Germany did too. Um, both have been remarkable model citizens, international citizens, uh, these last 50 years. And so it's part of this larger sweep to understand history. And then where does it go? Um, uh, this afternoon, we're going to begin with this panel discussion and then uh, Dr. Brzezinski will come back. I will sit and interview him in front of all of you and then try to bring together a larger conversation. So Mike, let me turn to you. Dr. Michael Green was the coordinator of our project. He was the man that selected these historians. And Mike, I turn it to you to get us started. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, John, and, uh, and welcome. Um, we promise to hold the rain off uh, until half an hour after we're done to reward you for coming out on what could be a rainy afternoon. Um, this has been a very interesting project. Um, I personally was trained as a political scientist, but in my heart, I'm really a historian. Um, and trying to draw from the lessons of history in the 20th century uh, as we think about the challenges of the 21st century has been a rewarding experience, I think, for, uh, for those of us from both disciplines, political science and history. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists briefly, but what we tried to do with this project was get um, leading scholars of uh, both um, uh, national histories and global history to talk about how the 20th century um, impacted the evolution of, of each of the major states we'll talk about, um, how it impacted their narratives, um, and, uh, and ultimately how those narratives about the experience of the 20th century uh, will in many ways come together in the 21st century, either in a cacophony of contrasting and competitive narratives, or perhaps to some extent uh, in a chorus of narratives that allow um, a order based on uh, development, um, uh, justice, uh, legitimacy, and inclusivity. And one of the big challenges of the 20th century was creating an international order that did those things, um, particularly since the old order, the imperial European dominated order, collapsed in the first part of the 20th century, and much of the rest of the century was a struggle um, uh, to find uh, uh, something new. Um, so we'll ask each panelist to, um, to open with about five minutes, a very brief uh, introduction of um, uh, how the 20th century is viewed uh, as a historical period uh, from the perspective of each of the countries we're looking at. Um, and then uh, after those very brief opening comments, I'll ask some cross-cutting thematic questions and, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, we are uh, publishing a book out of this um, and uh, had a conference this morning um, for the second time going into the chapters, some of the cross-cutting themes, some of the lessons. And uh, uh, this workshop is in addition to sharing our findings with you and getting uh, ideas from the audience uh, is also the last uh, turn of the wheel as we prepare a, a book. So if you enjoyed this, you can look forward to a readable uh, edited book coming up uh, sometime in the coming months. So let me introduce the panelists beginning uh, on the far end. Uh, Chemil Aydin is Associate Professor of History at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Uh, he grew up in Turkey um, and studied in Istanbul and at the University of Tokyo before receiving his PhD at Harvard. Um, his, um, his major books include Politics of Anti-Westernism in Asia, Visions of World Order in Pan-Islamic and Pan-Asian Thought, 2007. Uh, Chemil looks at things like the uh, Meiji modernization and its impact on thinking in Turkey and the Islamic world and so forth. Um, and he has an, a book coming out next year, The Idea of the Muslim World and Intellectual Global History uh, from Harvard University Press. Um, next to him is Professor Jen Chen, uh, the Hushi Professor of History for U.S.-China Relations at Cornell University and also teaching as part of NYU's uh, Shanghai program. Um, uh, Professor Chen is working on a book um, uh, that I'm very much looking forward to, um, a biography of Zhou Enlai, Zhou Enlai, The Man in His Times. Um, 
Next to him uh, is uh, Professor William Inboden, um, Associate Professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs, University of Texas, Austin. Will did the America paper. Um, he's also the Executive Director of the Clements Center for History and Strategy and Statecraft at the University of Texas, Austin. Um, and uh, focuses there on harnessing history to uh, scholarship and strategy and grad strategy. Um, Satoshi Ikeuchi is next to him, associate professor at the University of Tokyo. Um, Ikeuchi-san is um, Japan's leading scholar on the Islamic world and especially ISIS. Uh, his um, book, The Impact of the Islamic State, came out the same day as one of the Islamic State's major attacks. Uh, it was purely coincidental, but made him an instant celebrity in Japan trying to explain the Islamic State. But his scholarship is much broader and focuses on the um, uh, the Islamic world as a whole. Um, Hosoya, uh, Yuichi Hosoya, from uh, professor at Keio University, is, um, is next. Um, Hosoya-sensei is um, also at the Inter Institute for International Policy Studies. He's much sought after uh, in Japan, in the US, in Asia, in Europe, uh, for his expertise on Japanese foreign and security policy. Um, he's a historian by training. Um, he's a student of Professor Shinichi Kitaoka, who drafted the Japan paper, but as some of you know, Kitaoka-sensei has been appointed the president of JICA, uh, Japan's uh, development agency, and so um, he drafted his former student, uh, Hosoya-sensei, to help finish the chapter and give him uh, feedback from the conference. Um, and last but not least, um, uh, uh, Sebastian Conrad um, at the Free University of Berlin. Um, uh, Sebastian is a, tr is a true global historian. Um, his next book, uh, coming out in 2016, is What is Global History? Um, it comes out from Princeton University Press. Um, he and Chemil also have a forthcoming edited volume in the um, Harvard University Press History of the World, fourth volume, which looks at the period from 1750 to 1880 and is called Emerging Modernities. Uh, and Sebastian wrote the German chapter and, 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 and provided some of uh, the most critical insights we had as a group about how to think about glo global history in the 20th century. So let me ask, beginning with Chemil, for a brief introductory comment, and then I'll come back to you with some of the themes that we hear across the table. I was thinking that I'll be the last coming from Sebastian, but I can start first. Um, uh, our project partly dealt with the broader meaning of the 20th century. You know, what kind of a century was that? It was a century of, was this a century of humanity's emancipation, progress, and welfare, improvements in international justice, end of racism, decolonization, um, or is this a century of genocide, subjugation of human beings, elimination of cosmopolitan empires, and imposition of um, uh, national unities? Um, so the literature on the 20th century uh, is divided into these two camps. And some people consider it as divorce century in human history, as a century of violence and genocides. And some people consider it as a century that fulfilled some of the promises of enlightenment and, and liberation. And I think some of our colleagues will reflect on this, you know, how, how the century looks not only from Europe, European perspective, but from the non-European state perspective, because we are mostly familiar with the European perspective in the sense that a promise of modernity and enlightenment is being betrayed by um, two world wars, um, Holocaust and genocide, and then there's a sense of um, Europe is recovering from this shock and the dark side of modernity, and then um, establishing some sort of a, a 20th century achievements of modernity at the end of the century. From the Turkish perspective, it's, uh, it's brief, I will just go to the main argument of the paper, is that if you look at it today, um, as, as citizens of Turkish Republic and its achievement, it will also look overall very positive. That we are talking about a country with almost universal level of literacy, uh, women's empowerment, representation is, is highly achieved, and I am at UNC Chapel Hill, a colleague of uh, uh, the winner of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry this year, one of the winners, is a Turkish chemist, Aziz Sanjar, which made Republic of Turkey very proud after uh, Orhan Pamuk's Nobel Prize in Literature. But as he immediately emphasizes that he did all of his schooling um, in Turkish public schools, 
until he came to PhD in the United States. And, and he's, he's, uh, he's one of the eight children coming from uh, parents who, uh, one of them were illiterate. And so he, he had, you know, in his own remarks, he said that this is also an achievement of the Republic and it is um, its public uh, education system. Turkey has universal health care, everybody in, in some sort of free health care. Um, there are actually aspects of, of Turkish Republic for its citizens uh, is even better than the United States in sort of free higher education, free health care, some sort of economic prosperity. So that might look, look great. But on the other hand, we, we also see the dark sides of the 20th century in Turkish history. There were moments in this century uh, where uh, the areas around Turkey started as a cosmopolitan place with, full of Armenians and Greeks. They are not there anymore. Uh, instead, there are many um, other people who came from the Balkans, uh, from Caucasia. So we, at least Turkey, experienced one of some of the darkest aspects of population politics in the 20th century, of ethnic cleansings and genocides and movement of people, with so many shattered lives, uh, lives uh, so many traumas of the, of the century. Moreover, um, there are other aspects of Turkey. As Turkish citizens will always say that they will struggle for more rights, more human rights. There is some sort of politicization of identities of um, within Turkish politics, whether Kurdish, Turkish, or um, politicization of Islam and, and secularism. So if you, if you look at this, this broad picture of both the negative and the positive of the 20th century modernity, you could see that in the Turkish experience of modernity. But my second point is this following, that if we want to see at least one good example out of Turkey is, is that whatever the negativities and the positivities is that Turkey managed to establish a procedural democracy very successfully since 1950. Before 1950, Turkey was a, a one-party regime. And that stability and establishment of the democracy was one of the biggest achievements of Turkish Republic in the sense that all the elections since 1950 were fair. Um, no matter what complaints you have about the country, you could always fix it in the next election. Um, that, especially local elections, actually increased the quality of governance, both on a, on a state level and the municipal level. Um, and, and this has, a, a, if, if, if I, have, I was giving some sort of an example from Turkey for inspiration for Egyptians or uh, Pakistanis, um, this could be the strongest uh, um, uh, lesson that you could learn that you know you can fall down you have you may have dark moments but there there is a healing power to to multi-party democracy that that will lift you out of the dark moments of the 20th century and we had in turkish history moments of of um, coup d'etats tortures in, in prisons of suppression of diversity uh, kurdish especially for the kurdish identity but then country could imagine getting out of this my final point before I, I give the floor to my colleagues is that, um, is that enough? Meaning, am I uh, presenting some sort of a happy end to the 20th century Turkish modernity experience? That is not enough because Turkey also has to be seen within a broader global context of, uh, of some sort of a defective international order uh, that was established after 1945. Uh, the UN system, um, some sort of um, a, a world order that is after decolonization, but it's not fully fair, it's not fully inclusive. Uh, there are also different uh, narratives of what the world should look like. And in, uh, that became one of Turkey's major problems, af especially after 2011, is how to reconcile a kind of pro-European Union narrative of Turkish modernity with broadly circulating uh, Muslim and European narratives of the 20th century. And at certain moments, the Turkish uh, government and elites thought that they should just build a wall to the Middle East and they should have nothing to do with, with the Arab world and the, the, the broader Muslim societies. Um, but at other moments, and, and, and because of the public pressure, there's also an attempt to reconcile both the Eurocentric narratives of modernity and good governance, democracy, with the general Muslim uh, imaginations of, of a fair, uh, just world order. And this is an impossible task to achieve, but this is the, one of the basic uh, challenges of Turkish state in the 21st century today. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mike, and thank you for this audience to give me this opportunity to share uh, some of uh, my thinking of 20th century uh, Chinese experience in the context of global uh, count and uh, global uh, changes. And my paper's title is China's Prolonged Rise, a 20th Century Tale, and its implications for the 21st century. So the main part of the paper Basically, as a historian, as a historian, I tell stories, and there are many different dimensions of the Chinese story of the 20th century. But let us be <coughs> very, um, very much to the point. The 20th century began with China as a, a um, empire the Manchu Qing Empire, entering the 20th century in crisis. And uh, in the 1911 revolution, it collapsed. Then we see the emergence of modern Chinese nationalism, accompanied with this um, emerging nationalism, was revolution after revolution, was crisis. And all of this led finally to the 1949 establishment of the People's Republic of China. It was a revolutionary country for the moment. Under Mao's leadership, communist China challenged the existing international order. Indeed, in the 27 years Mao reigned China, China experienced a series of domestic revolutions while at the same time engaging in all kinds of international conflicts. Still, interestingly, toward the later years of Mao's reign, the Chinese-American rapprochement occurred, which was followed by the unfolding of reform and opening period. As a result, China survived, communist China survived the end of global Cold War, and toward the end of the 20th century, entering the 21st century, China has been transformed. It, was the, it is the second largest economy in the world. Indeed, the so-called China's rise has been widely uh, talked, discussed, debated in the world is a phenomenon that needs to be seriously considered and dealt with in the 21st century, either as a huge opportunity or serious challenge. So how can we read all of this? There are many dimensions of the tale I can tell, but let me emphasize a few points here. One was that people should consider China as having played an extremely positive role in some of the major events in the 20th century. China stood on the correct history's correct side in the First World War and the Second World War. China entered the global Cold War as one of the communist bloc members, but toward the later stage of the Cold War accompanying the Sino-Soviet split and also Chinese-American rapprochement, China was no longer an active part of the global Cold War. Indeed, no other country probably had played a more important and salient role than China in bringing the Cold War to, to its end with the collapse of the communist bloc and international communism as a 20th century phenomenon. And during the process, China had experienced all kinds of domestic um, upheavals. And there were wars, civil wars, international wars, and also in the Mao, there were all kinds of domestic revolutions. And still, after all, Chinese embers of modernity had made its very tortuous progress advance. And as a result, you find that 20th century had witnessed China after the collapse of pre-modern empire, had emerged as a 
modern state and multinationalities making positive contributions in the world. So how can we read all of these you know, stories and try to make sense of them? And for me, this story probably has to be read also from the 21st century vantage point. So let me try to uh, share with people what I see as the implications of China's 20th century experience and its impact upon the 21st century. And China's economic growth is, is extraordinary and real. If not anything else, China today is the second largest economy in the world. And also, with the progressing of the reform opening project, Chinese society had been changed. So Maoist political priority had long gone, and there was no hope of returning. Chinese society has become more diverse and poor. Chinese economy has been further integrated into the world market. And China has also played all kinds of positive roles in global matters and affairs. And for, among other things, the Chinese role in controlling the 2008 global financial crisis. And also now, China is also playing in a positive role in controlling an impact of global uh, climate change. In understanding the Chinese, uh, the prospect of China's rise, I will argue this is what I say in the paper. China today is not William II's Germany in the First World War, not Hitler's Germany, Mussolini's Italy, or militarist Japan in the Second World War, and not the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And I would like to highlight one aspect. China's relations with America today are fundamentally different from Soviet American relations during the Cold War. Unlike the Soviet Union, China today does not present itself as an, as an alternative in terms of how the mainstream path toward modernity and postmodernity should and can be uh, defined to the American patterns of development of way of life. Unlike the Soviet Union, China today is an integral part of the global economic system and institution, not an outsider of them. Unlike the Soviet Union, China today does not have its own military alliance, a bloc, that stand in confrontation with America's worldwide alliance system. I further argue the overwhelming majority of the problems between China and the United States are the ones that have existed between America and its Western allies and Japan. If not for anything else, I would like to remind the people of one of the best-selling books of the 1980, late 1980s, entitled The Coming War with Japan. Who remembered? However, China's rise is with its own dilemmas and hurdles. That's why I call it China's prolonged rise. And in the past two decades, the Chinese communist state has continuously taken full advantage of China's economic growth. Accompanied this is that the Chinese, so-called Chinese communist state is increasingly made anything but communist. So what is the supporting legitimacy foundation of the Chinese state? The Chinese state's legitimacy today is defined in ways no more than I will call performance-based legitimacy. To a very large extent, it is not justified by anything else, moral or ideological beliefs, but the simple fact that China was, has achieved economic rapid growth. Also, China's phenomenal economic expansion has been accompanied by profound and continuous transformation of Chinese society. 
releasing new and powerful social forces that the country had never seen in its history. So the convergence of reduced economic growth rate, which I think is inevitable, which we are already seeing, and increasing social and political diversity will inevitably challenge the country's political structure. In the meantime, China had lived through the age of revolutions, and the legacy of that age is reflected in the breakdown of the moral norms of the Chinese society, a phenomenon that has been deepened as the result of the rampant materialism in the reform and opening era. Probably equally, if not more important, is that if China is to become a respected and greater power in the world, it is essential for, China, for the Chinese to get out the shadow of their victim mentality and the nationalist sentiment associated with it. Do I need a supporting evidence? You only need to remember that the Chinese national anthem has remained the anti-Japanese imperialism song made in the 1930s. There's nothing wrong with that. However, it is also problematic if this has been made the sole supporting foundation to the legitimacy claim of the state. Probably the most important and the more difficult, the most difficult challenge China is facing is how to envision and pursue political reforms aiming at not only maintaining and enhancing the functioning and operation capacity of the state, but also introducing a structure characterized by power checking and balancing. And as a first step toward the direction, what is needed is what had made the Chinese civilization so profound, so continuous and prolonged that it was in the Axis age of the Chinese civilization. There was a, a time called allow 100 flowers to blossom, letting 100 schools compete with each other. Is this happening in China? The Chinese people also need, also face a daunting task of rebuilding or rebuilding or building or rebuilding the moral foundation of society in the ongoing pursuit of modernity and postmodernity, so that China's continuous rise will satisfy not, not only the people's improved material needs, but also their search for meanings of life. In all these aspects, China still has a long way to go. Therefore, China's rise will have to be a very prolonged one. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I was reminder, rem reminded that our own national anthem is based on our anti-imperialist song from 1812, but, <laughs> but it's, a, it's an important point. Uh, Will? That's very important. Yeah. Well, uh, even though our focus is on the 20th century, I tried to start my uh, paper in the 17th century, so my challenge is to cover 400 years in five minutes. Um, so uh, so I, uh, I start by talking about, I think there are uh, to three sacred texts in American history in our founding era, and these sacred texts em um, embody a lot of the debates that characterized continue to characterize American history, but especially came to the fore uh, in the, the crucible of the mid-20th century. And I argue that these debates were at least partially resolved then uh, by three American presidents, and so I'll walk you through that. So the first uh, sacred text is John Winthrop's famous uh, sermon on the ship Arbella when he said, we shall be as a city upon a hill, the eyes of all people are upon us. Um, of course, that's been repeated many times throughout American history by many of our presidents. But contained within that uh, soaring rhetoric is a question. Does this mean that America was supposed to be a model to the world or had a mission to the world? And embodied in that are questions, should America pursue a more isolationist foreign policy or a more internationalist foreign policy? policy. Uh, the second uh, sacred text is the Declaration of Independence, of course, with its uh, famous opening that uh, uh, we hold these truths are to be self-evidence, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. Um, 
But, but again, uh, behind that, there are a couple questions. Uh, at the founding, did that, uh, did that st soaring statement of human equality uh, apply to all human beings or only to white male property holders? Um, and then second uh, is, does that statement apply to everyone on earth or only to American citizens? Um, and then the third uh, canonical uh, sacred text from the founding era is President Washington's farewell address. Uh, which is much more uh, subtle and interesting than uh, is, is often appreciated, but the most uh, you know, famously remembered line is, it is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. Uh, and uh, and uh, again, that also raised questions. Was that an enduring transcendent principle that Washington was laying down, that at no p time and place ever in history should the United States have a foreign alliance? Or did that only apply to the nation in the late 18th century that had just barely won its independence from its imperial overlord and was still relatively weak and powerless and vulnerable on the global stage? Uh, so was that a time-bound or a transcendent, transcendent principle? And so uh, those three questions about does America have a mission to the world or just to, to be a model, should it engage in formal alliances or not, and do its uh, uh, principles of human equality apply to the whole world and to all human beings or just to white male property holders or uh, white Americans, those characterize debates over the next two, three hundred years in the United States. And uh, coming to the 20th century, uh, I argue that the United States um, underwent a couple of profound transitions that at least partially, uh, though not completely answer those uh, answer those debates. And these transitions took place under three presidents, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, and Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, and so really in the middle, the middle three decades of that, uh, that very, very tumultuous century. Another important thing to realize though is that is these debates took place not just internally in the United States, but in the midst, in the fulcrum of geopolitics. Uh, it was the rise of Nazism, the carnage of World War II, and then the uh, early nuclear tensions of the, of, of the Cold War. War. And so just as Americans are wrestling with these questions domestically, the shape of those questions and the answers were being strongly informed by, it, by international politics. And so I think the transitions that America underwent, led by these presidents, were from, uh, from relative isolationism to internationalism, including uh, from eschewing formal alliances to then uh, creating a whole new, very dense uh, international network of formal alliances and stationing troops permanently uh, abroad. And then domestically, uh, I think the United States underwent a, a transition from uh, relative intolerance and hostility to, to pluralism to a more inclusive picture of pluralism. Um, FDR uh, began to lead the way uh, with uh, his denunciations of isolationism and his preparing the United States for intervention in Europe and, and, in, uh, and, in, and in World War II, as well as with his uh, post-war vision embodied in the Atlantic Charter, which later uh, laid, laid the groundwork for the international and multilateral institutions the United States helped, political and economic, the United States helped create towards, towards the end of the war. A uh, little less remembered as FDR took some uh, to initial steps towards more pluralism, more in the realm of religious pluralism than, than racial pluralism, although he uh, desegregated uh, defense contractors, took some modest steps towards um, greater civil rights for African Americans. Um, of course, he presided over a great expansion of women in the workforce, which led to a great expansion of women's rights over, overall. Uh, and, uh, and, and especially with um, uh, his early visions of bringing Protestants, Catholics, and Jews all equally part of the, the American social, social order. Uh, Truman, of course, continued this with presiding over the formal creation of many of these uh, international institutions, uh, including some of America's uh, per first permanent alliances, especially embodied in, embodied in NATO, uh, as well as desegregating the, the armed forces, uh, forging uh, as a, America was still largely a Protestant culture at the time, but Truman did quite a bit to bring Catholics and Jews more into public life, uh, and as well as some very important but symbolic uh, steps such as uh, creating a diplomatic partnership with the Vatican and uh, extending diplomatic recognition to Israel upon its creation in, in 1948. And then Eisenhower, of course, uh, again continued this, deepening uh, America's alliance structure, especially in the, in the Asia Pacific. Um, finally, uh, 
uh, d at least he thought for the time defeating the isolation sentiments within his own Republican Party, uh, taking significant steps towards uh, desegregation, especially when he sent uh, uh, you know uh, National Guard into Little Rock, Ar Little Rock, Arkansas, and then presiding over a much more inclusive uh, American civil religion uh, again for Protestants, Catholics, Jews, and then Eisenhower took it even further to Muslims and Buddhists and and Hindus as, as well. Uh, he's the first American president to ever visit a mosque, as he did at the uh, uh, dedication ceremony of the uh, Washington Islamic Center just up the street, up, up Massachusetts Avenue here. Um, so I argue that these, these three presidents, in the midst of the, uh, the fulcrum of World War II and the Cold War, uh, helped resolve some of these perennial debates from the American founding and, and, and before. Not, not finally, but at least they put the, the nation institutionally in a direction more towards uh, internationalism, towards uh, international leadership, towards alliances, uh, towards civil rights, and towards a more inclusive pluralism. Uh, and then this leads now to, I think, the, the two main uh, narratives, which some could say are competing, others could say are complementary of how Americans, how we ourselves see the 20th century. Um, one would be the greatest generation narrative uh, of the United States uh, leading uh, global liberation uh, from fascism and, and communism, and then showing, showing gl uh, glo global leadership and the creation of a new international order. Um, and the other one would be the more domestically focused one of uh, progressive, uh, progressive justice, uh, focusing on the civil rights movement, uh, women's rights movement, um, uh, pluralism and, 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 and diversity. Um, and I think those two narratives, uh, even though they have different emphases, can actually uh, exist and, and, and complement each other. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm not a uh, um, um, tough, you know, writing chapters and most all, all of them. Uh, them, uh, all of us, uh, except me uh, writing chapters, so I'm, I feel, I feel uneasy about it, but um, I, I was asked to make comments to um, uh, draft chapters, and, but only five minutes, I, I just keep my comment uh, very short. Um, 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 five chapters, US, China, Germany, Japan, Turkey, all of them are kind of um, successful member of nation states. Um, I myself is I my, I myself am working on the Arab world, and my uh, feel unease about it. You know, um, there's a strong counter narrative um, disseminated mainly from the Arab world or Islamic world, it's about Islamism or Islamic identity, then nowadays the Islamic identity is just, you know, making, uh, just become, becoming a you know, very simple idea of jihadism. jihadism. Um, uh, all of these uh, five countries, they are immune to this kind of, you know, counter-narrative. Uh, Turkey, Turkish, there's some danger among Turkish. Um, uh, for me, it's very interesting. You know, Jamil's draft chapter, you know, it's a kind of intellectual journey of yourself and your nation going back and forth between Islamic um, identity to very Eurocentric nation state idea. Uh, there's, it's a success story, Turkish success story, but uh, there's ambivalence, strong sense of ambivalence, and Japan share some part of this ambivalence. And I, I hope that this book would be I mean, more, you know, the, this ambivalence would be integrated into each chapter of this book. You know, it's not in 20th century, Basically, 20th century is a success story, success stories of nation states. And now, almost no one um, argue about you know, alternative to this nation state system. So nation states with you know, pluralist democracy is universal. You know, there's no arguing about it. But Practically, at the end of the 20th century, and, and, and at now it's now, we are in the 
21st century, um, there's no competing idea, set of ideas to nation states and uh, pluralist democracy. But at the same time, we find that this is, you know, practically, it's not applicable to all the corners of the world, even though, you know, there are counter narratives, competing counter narratives, but they, they cannot be, you know, these ide ideologies cannot be universal. But um, we know that um, there are some parts of the world. That, it's for some reasons, they cannot incorpor incorporate uh, this universal idea. So what, what, what the dividing the, uh, are factors? So, so these five chapters are very helpful to have, to get some ideas. And uh, all the, not, not, not all of them, but all of the countries in, um, in the five chapters are ex-empires, maybe except the United States. <laughs> but, and in 20th, if we look back to the 20th century, it's a uh, um, collapse of empires and dismemberment of empires. And after this collapse of empires, some of the leading nations are uh, rise. And uh, German, Germany, Japan, Turkey, you know, and China, maybe United States. <laughs> uh, but um, th there are other parts of the world. Uh, they, it's open to question why other parts of the world cannot attain this kind of some standard of basic standard of nation state. There are many, many, many reasons, but still we do not have solutions to this uh, struggle to unattainable nation state, even though we all know that this is the best choice. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you very much for having me in this uh, symposium. I'm Michio Sohyo, and I'm replacing Professor Kitaoka's role. So I have to say that in the beginning, I apologize that I'm not Shinichi Kitaoka. But, uh, well, I, I was formerly a student of Professor Kitaoka, and I have been influenced by Professor Kitaoka for the last 25 years, perhaps. So it's a philosophical question. Uh, to what extent, my own historical understanding is different from Professor Kitaoka's historical understanding. And also there is a link between Professor Kitaoka's historical understanding with Abe's statement, because uh, Kitaoka played the most important role in preparing for the historical statement as the acting uh, chair of uh, the advisory panel on historical issues. So, well, he has been, I mean, Professor Kitaoka has been influencing uh, not just my historical understanding, but perhaps also upon the recent Prime Minister Abe's statement. And of course, because of the fact that this year marks the 70th anniversary of the end of the Second World War, uh, suddenly historical issues have become one of the most important political agenda. Not just that, because of Japanese uh, diplomatic relationship with surrounding country, particularly with China and South Korea, history has been a very important, sometimes of struggles, sometimes some assets. Uh, when we think about Japan's uh, relationship with these countries, so that's why I think that the historical issues now are very important political uh, issues for Japanese politics. And besides that, I will talk about Japanese experience in the 20th century. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, Japan is, or Japanese historical experience in the 20th century is far from normal. And sometimes people ask whether Japan is a normal country or not. But at least I can say that Japanese historical experience in the 20th century is far from normal because Japan uh, began from a peripheral po 
poor country in the first e Far East, uh, particularly in the middle of the 19th century, but uh, when Japan opened the war in 1941, Japan became one of the strongest military power in the world. And then in 1945, Japan was defeated country, defeated the poor country, very weak country. But uh, well, after 70 years, Japan now becomes one of the richest countries in the world. So Japan experienced a huge turbulence. And in the sense, it's difficult for many countries to share how Japanese people has been feeling about this historical experience. So it's also always difficult uh, to, to define Japanese place or Japanese role in 20th century uh, global history. And, but, well, at the same time, I can also perhaps say that uh, Prime Minister Abe's historical statement, which was issued in August, on August 14, this can become one of the most important national consensus. Uh, Prime Minister Abe is often regarded as a quite right-wing political leader, uh, one of the most right-wing, or one of the most conservative, perhaps, prime ministers, which we have had. But at the same time, Prime Minister Abe upholds Murayama's statement. Um, Murayama is, uh, is a socialist prime minister, and his statement represents quite a liberal view of Japanese role in the 20th century. So the combination of the two prime ministers, right-wing conservative prime minister Shinzo Abe and the left-wing prime minister uh, Tomichi Murayama, and the combination of the two historical statements, because Prime Minister Abe upholds Murayama's statement. This re can represent Japanese national consensus on historical experience. So what is that? What the essence of that historical statement? The, one of the most important the essence of our historical experience is that in 1945, uh, we actually became a quite different country. Before 1945, Japan had been a quite ambivalent country, whether Japan should uphold uh, international cooperation or international society, or whether Japan should radically revise or modify international norms, because Japanese position was quite abnormal. Japan was the first non-Western country, first non-white country which became a great power, which can influence the direction of the international politics. So many people in the world, uh, in, sorry, many people in Japan thought further uh, Japan uh, should become another Western country, another European country, or further Japan should play a totally different kind of international role. That's why before 1945, basically, Japanese people were quite ambivalent in Japan's role in global history. And uh, there were three main ideologies at the time, nationalism, internationalism, and the Asianism. In 1931, when Japan caused the Manchurian crisis, I think that uh, Japanese internationalism was more or less dead. So after 1935, we could see the combination of nationalist ideology and Asianist ideology. And based upon this ideology, Japan expanded its influence in the Asian continent. And finally, Japan caused the war against China in 1937 and against the United States in 1945. By using its military power, Japan tried to change international order, but it failed. So in 1945, the Japanese people decided to transform our own national identity. And then two uh, ideologies emerged. One is pacifism, and the other one is internationalism based upon economic growth. So by combining two different ideologies, economic growth and pacifism, this actually 
um, uh, uh, created uh, sort of a new consensus in Japanese foreign policy. This is often called uh, the Yoshida Doctrine. Japan has been holding or defending this Yoshida Doctrine ideology by combining two things. One is pacifism, and the other one is uh, economic growth. Or Japan created a new model for uh, Asian countries. Uh, this is a developmental model. So two issues, peace and prosperity should be a main a norm for Asian countries. And I think that more or less, Japan could successfully expand that ideology by combining two things, pacifism and also economic growth. But, uh, well, I will soon end. In now, once again, Japan is facing a new identity crisis. Whether Japan should maintain this ideology? Because, well, of course, Japan is now number three economy, a big, largest economy in the world. And it is more and more difficult to maintain this position in the international community because of the relative decline of Japanese economic power. So maybe I think that Japan should present a new international identity to the world. And of course, the new international identity of Japan should be based upon sound historical understanding. That's why we should learn something from history. We cannot deny historical facts. And based upon the sound, profound historical identity, I think that the Japanese new prime ministers will create a brighter future for or Japanese uh, position in the international community. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thanks. Um, well, listening to these different perspectives from different places in the world, it's clear that the world looks very different depending on from where, from where you look. Uh, it's also clear that five minutes are actually quite different depending on from where you speak. And I'll, so I'll add my version of five minutes. Uh, and I, I think after what has been said, I, I'll briefly reflect on um, what it actually means um, to ask, you know, what can we learn from the history of the 20th century? Because essentially I think there are two ways of thinking about what such a retrospective uh, view actually can add. And the first one we've essentially talked about, namely the past in some ways is still with us, right? So uh, particular events, particular moments, processes that evolved in the 20th century in some ways shaped uh, the world we still live in. They shaped the institutions, they shaped some patterns, some f sort of frameworks within, we s w within which we still think even without sometimes knowing it. So it's important to sort of recognize, if you will, the staying power of these structures, right? So that would be perspective number one. The other perspective <clears throat> is different. It means, uh, it, it relates less to the way in which the past, sort of in a, if you will, trajectory towards the future, shapes the future, but it's almost the reverse. It's about how we, with our narratives of the past, have an impact uh, on, on the present and the future. And by this I mean that the narratives that people tell about the past, um, they are usually, <clears throat> they, they, they serve as, as, as claims-making statements. So, so whatever social groups or individuals or NGOs tell us narratives about the past, and they, they, they immediately intervene with these narratives uh, into <clears throat> present-day pol uh, political uh, discussions and conflicts. So, so what that means is that these narratives themselves, or if you will, memory of that past, is with us, and not only shapes the way in which we look at the past, but it also shapes the way in which we actually negotiate the present and the future. And this is a lesson, I think, that can be easily gleaned from a brief look at uh, Germany's 20th century history, where pretty much everything, if you will, in terms of the narratives <clears throat> the Germans tell themselves about their own nation, revolves around the Holocaust. Uh, you know, r broadly speaking, everything before 1945 was a prehistory. Everything after 1945 was an aftermath uh, of, uh, of the Holocaust. And, and the way in which Germans have talked about this and narrated it and memorialized it has uh, almost evolved into a particular form of industry. The Germans are now proud to be exporters of 
you know, or, or representatives of the nation that really came to terms with the past. And really, almost, you know, wherever you look, the way the, in which the Germans integrated into the West, the, the way the Germans integrated into the European Union, the way in which reunification was organized, it all depended on a particular way in which this coming to terms with the past had succeeded. So it's almost inconceivable uh, to understand reunification or European integration after 1993 without these particular claims on the past, namely that Germany had mastered it. And I think this is, a, this is not a German peculiarity, but in many ways it is a pattern. So for example, when Poland exceeded the European Union, immediately conflicts broke out about Polish uh, you know, c coming to terms with the, with, an, with, a, with, a, with Second World War past in Poland. To what extent were, were the Poles actually also perpetrators and not just victims, as the national narrative had it? As soon as accession talks were opened with Turkey, immediately the issue of the uh, massacre of the Armenians comes to the fore. So, in other words, these narratives of the past continue to be claims-making statements for particular groups. And they, in that sense, remain with us. This is clearly one of the lessons in which I think history continues to impact um, present-day politics and the future. And the strange thing is, and with this I close, that you know, we would assume that, uh, say, after 1990 or the turn of the century, these kinds of memories are sort of on the wane. That is, most of the people who really mem mem have memories themselves of the war uh, you know, they, they, they begin to disappear, they're no longer with us. So what we would expect that the impact and the power, the relevance uh, of these narratives uh, decreases. But the paradoxical thing is that the, the, the reverse, quite the reverse is true. In fact, <clears throat> since the millennium, we've had a virtual explosion of, of these memory debates virtually everywhere around the world. And what now happens increasingly is that these debates are no longer conducted within societies, but memory activists, if that's what you want to call them, they now look for a, a global audience. They <clears throat> see a global, emerging global public sphere as a forum in which to negotiate their claims. And the Armenian genocide case I I is a prime example of this mechanism. So what we see actually is that these claims on the past are proliferating, they're actually increasing. And in that sense, the past is with us even more than it used to be. And, and the strange thing is that in some ways you could even say that it's emerged, I mean, discussions about the past and, and, and memory, if you will, have emerged as key sites of negotiating issues of geopolitics or social justice in an age after the great ideologies. So negotiating memory is almost the only, if you will, symbolic language left uh, in an age that's... Uh, um, that's characterized by the end of the Cold War and, and, and a globalized future that's entirely open. Uh, thank you all um, for the papers, which everyone will see soon in this book, and for your concise uh, comparative um, perspectives. The, the book um, uh, and the project asked the authors to think about the 20th century around four um, drivers for change. Um, obviously, technological change. The century began uh, with the internal combustion engine and ended with the internet. Um, war, uh, the First World War and the Second World War in particular, destroyed empires, um, delegitimized empires, um, ra radically shifted the global distribution of power. Um, social revolutions, which, which, which flowed from these first two drivers, the empowerment of women, minorities, as, as Will pointed out, and then the effort to try to find global governance uh, as the European centered order at the beginning of the century collapsed and was replaced uh, with mixed success by the, by the League of Nations, the Washington Treaty System, finally the United Nations and Bretton Woods systems, the most successful backed as they were by American power. Um, but as we were discussing this this morning, this story of the um, destruction of the European led uh, order and of European imperialism and its replacement by a relatively more legitimate uh, decolonialized world with, um, with comparatively more legitimate and inclusive institutions um, sounds an awful lot like um, the triumph of the West. So I put that out as a provocative question. 
uh, for one or two of the audience uh, of, of the panelists. Let me start with Chimel, if I may. Is, 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 are we correct in thinking ultimately of the 20th century as the triumph of transatlantic ideals, even though the uh, transatlantic centered or European centered order has now been distributed across the globe? I guess we can say yes and no that uh, partly uh, thanks to Kemalism in Turkey, the sort of pro-Western um, modernization project, uh, and also in China, uh, you know, both the uh, May Ford and the uh, um, communist model, that you can see that uh, there are Eurocentric uh, values and norms being triumphant in the 20th century. So we can say despite decolonization and the elimination of the idea of white man's superiority, certain norms originating from um, Europe dominated. But as uh, Satoshi warned, there are also norms that, that is not originating from Europe that, but also became globalized. And I think we should pay attention to that. Intra-regional conversations, whether in, in Asia, in, in Africa, in Islamic age societies, um, that uh, globalize some of the values and, and narratives. Um, Professor Chen, let me ask you the same question. And maybe you can elaborate a bit on your uh, point about China being on the right side of history throughout much of the 20th century. But does that mean that China will emerge in the 21st century satisfied with, clearly not, uh, the, 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 the arc of institution building and, and, and global order and justice in the 20th century? Concerning the question whether or not China will be satisfying with the kind of 20th century experience and all result, the, the answer is again yes or no. You know, because it's a still, as I say, China is in the process of a prolonged, you know, rise. And this is both for the Chinese and for the world. That means opportunities, a lot of challenges. And when I say China was on the right side of history during the First World War and the Second World War, that actually extremely important for the Chinese. And the First World War and the Second World War were interrelated. The First World War was to a very large extent still so-called a European Civil War. However, toward the end of the war, uh, the, you know, the Paris Peace Conference, and you already find the Wilsonian, you know, 14 points, which try to argue for the need of establish new world order characterized by a series of new norms, which uh, was resisted by several European countries to a certain extent and also by Japan, but China embraced wholeheartedly. Indeed, one of the main, main Chinese intellectuals who became later a founder of the Chinese Communist Party, Chen Duxiu, a professor at Peking University, and um, he said that Wilson was indeed the first good man under uh, the heaven. You know, that speaks a lot. And then during the Second World War, and China indeed was on the side of allies. And the Second World War, to a very large extent, was fought, among other things, for a new world order, which is the principle of which was outlined at the very beginning, at the early stage of the war, by the Atlantic Charter. I think this is extremely important, and I also would like to argue there were also interconnections between the Wilsonian 14 points and the Atlantic Charter, which further led to the establishment of a series of institutions after the Second World War, including the United Nations and also United Nations Declaration, you know, things like that. And of all this, China embraced. So this is extremely important. They have set the basic tone and also a series of important conditions for China later to become an insider of the international, of the existing international system, which is the result and order in the system, which is a result of decolonization. And ideologically, this is also a result of anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism. And this is also very, very compatible with the Chinese experience in the 20th century, despite the destructive moment of, uh, of a Maoist revolution, and continuous revolution, and still it was possible for China to embark upon the process of reforming and opening to the outside world, entering the, the, the later stage of the Cold War and a post-Cold War emerging as an insider of the international order. Thank you. Um, I should mention to the audience, we also have a scholar who wrote on India. We, we, we would have and should have and uh, done more uh, countries, but eventually budget and page numbers run out. So this is representative 
um, although all of these are generally successful nation states, and all of these, uh, Turkey, China, the US, Japan, Germany, India, are um, states that um, emerged from the 20th century uh, w w believing that the nation state is the is sort of the center of the of the system, even as in different ways all of these countries have accepted international or global governance. Um, so there is that. But one thing that sets apart the U.S. will from all the other countries we've looked at is that the 20th century, if you step back and look at it in comparative perspective, not you, you describe very well the internal contradictions uh, that the U.S. dealt with in terms of a more just uh, society and so forth. But if you compare the U.S. experience in the 20th century, um, it's nowhere near as traumatic as any country represented on this stage, not even close. Um, and we noted this morning that in your chapter, the, the American narrative about the 20th century appears to be much less important about how we think about the 21st century compared with these other major nation states that have all been traumatized, in some cases multiple times, by the 20th century. Is it that we're just dumb, lucky, and happy? Um, is it anti-intellectual? Uh, or is there some hidden narrative about the 20th century in the American body politic that we, that we perhaps just don't always see because we were, in effect, the victors in the two major wars and the victory ideologically? You know, uh, very well put, Mike. I mean, if we were to sum up the 20th century for a lot of the rest of the world, it is a very traumatic century. Yeah, Dr. Chen, okay. Oh, that's right, thanks. Uh, very traumatic century. And yet, for the United States, it was more or less, all things considered, uh, a more triumphant century with, uh, you know, great progress, great advances, great increases in prosperity and power and global influence, and relatively less, uh, le less cost in terms of human suffering and, and, and carnage. Uh, but then here, I'm, I'm also struck as we, you know, sit still on the, the early phase of the 21st century that a lot of these debates still aren't fully resolved for the United States, and we're still trying to figure out our, our way in the world. Uh, and, you know, uh, there were some voices saying that this should be yet another American century as the last one was. Uh, others saying, well, we may have had our particular day in the sun, but now as the United States is in relative decline, it's time to uh, take, a, take a back seat and uh, acknowledge a truly multipolar order and have other countries uh, play, uh, do their fair share for, uh, for glo maintaining global order, order and, and stability. And then even, even at home, uh, you know, we've got ongoing debates over the balance between diversity and pluralism and then some semblance of national unity and a, and a common national character and, and identity. And, you know, some, some, uh, certainly some communities still feeling like they are not fully embraced in uh, the American social order and don't fully have buy-in on, on the, American, the American dream, looking at uh, you know, some of the campus unrest that has, uh, has popped up in, in, in the last few months, which is, I, I think, emblem, emblematic of this. Uh, so uh, the, uh, you know, the, the narrative of it being a triumphant and relatively uh, uh, cost-free century doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, the past is not necessarily prologue for the United States, as we're still asking a lot of these, these hard, hard questions, uh, qu questions again today. Um, let me ask uh, Josue Sensei, put you on the spot uh, even more. I mean, we, you know, we were asked to do this in the context of the 70th anniversary of the end of the war. And the idea was to explore with scholars around the world what the 20th century meant in terms of the national narratives of other major powers. Um, and of course, for the advisory commission of the prime minister uh, convened within Japan, this was one of the themes. You were on the, uh, uh, partly involved in that panel. So this was also a theme is contextualizing. Um, um, and uh, as you said, if, if it works well, it should break open a more honest debate about history and facts in Japan. Because right now, you have contrasting national narratives about the 20th century, but within Japan, you have sharply contrasting narratives about the 20th century. On the left, uh, liberals, I mean the far left, liberals, the center right, the far right, there are, there are national narratives in Japan that, that almost see no common ground in terms of historical fact. And I wonder if you could say a bit more um, on the ground in Japan since the Prime Minister's statement and so forth, do you see a possibility of a, of a, of a, of a, of a new debate or of, a, of, a, or of a, uh, an opening of debate among these different very strictly separated narratives about the 20th century? Yeah, thank you very much. Very good, important question. Uh, I think that uh, 
Well, until recently, many people worried that uh, Prime Minister Abe would revise the previous Prime Minister's statements. And I don't think that this was his own intention. I mean, the biggest thing is that uh, historical issues now can easily be put on the diplomatic agenda between Japan and China, between Japan and Korea. So without the facing these difficult agendas, issues, we cannot create a better relationship with our surrounding country, not just Japan, China, Korea, but United States, European country, Australia as well. So it's imperative. It's really necessary to have, a, as I said, a quite sound understanding of our history. We have to face it. We have to face the historical facts. We have to know it. We have to learn it. But uh, I think that after Murayama's statement of 1995, even though many people highly evaluate Murayama's statement, I, I, I mainly uh, highly evaluate that. But the point <coughs> is that after Murayama's statement of 1995, both left-wingers and right-wingers have been quite frustrated and quite uh, 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 annoyed with the division of opinions within Japanese public opinion. And now we have to have much broader national consensus on historic issues. Of course, we can never perhaps have a consensus, national consensus, but uh, we have to share some of the under historic understanding. And I think that Prime Minister, Murayama's, uh, Prime Minister Abe's statement is widely supported by Japanese public opinion. So major newspaper highly evaluated that, and uh, uh, many historians more or less suppose that. But extreme right-wingers and extreme left-wingers hate it. I mean, both of them really don't like it. And they have a very radical, strong ideology. And they are frustrated by centrist historical statement by Prime Minister Abe. But uh, I think that uh, by abandoning both extreme right-wingers and extreme left-wingers, now we are creating a national consensus. And before 1945, Japanese government and the Japanese leaders made many mistakes. Prime Minister Abe admitted that. And that's fine. Because of the mistakes, I mean, because of the to decisions, uh, we uh, caused so many troubles before 1945. But uh, in 1945, after the end of the war, Japanese people, Japanese government, and the Japanese leaders fully acknowledged that we made many mistakes. And based upon that historical lesson, we have to create a better country, better future. Well, that's why we chose in 1945, pacifist path or peace-loving country path. And also, that's why we largely abandoned using our military might. Rather than that, we should use economic power to change our future direction. Well, that's why I think that in the last seven decades, may, many Japanese people welcome this new national identity. And maybe we can consolidate it. And, uh, now, I think this national identity becomes stronger by Prime Minister Abe's statement. And I think that, as I said, this statement or the essence of the statement can be shared by many people in Japan, regardless of a very strong criticism for, from the two sides. Um, I'm going to give you the last word before we open to the audience, Sebastian. You've given a lot of thought to these uh, questions and written on it extensively, so you can pick up whatever you like from the panel's previous discussion, but I'd, I'd ask you first, if you could, to clarify one thing. Um, this historiography that's so prevalent in Germany, where the Holocaust is the prehistory, and then after 1945 is the mastering of that history uh, and the end of deviance, um, are you arguing, and this is particularly important in terms of the lessons for Japan, are you arguing that it's bad historiography or it's bad public policy? or it's not bad, or perhaps it's both. Um, what are the implications of that, in other words, um, for, uh, for Germany, but for other countries that are trying to contextualize their past uh, and be honest about it? And then feel free to wrap us up. Right, I guess on this issue of, of, of memory debates, I would, so the, the, the usual perspective is that Germany is an unusual case in the sense that 
there was an enormous sort of learning process. So the you know the the the, the, the all this Nazi nation um, understood at some point uh, you know what it had done wrong and. Uh, and sort of learned from it and improved. So, so this this learning process narrative, I think this is the, the German post-war ideology. And this learning process narrative has also been used by other countries um, to, you know, to use Germany as a model. Uh, look how they have, you know, this kind of self, how, how should I say, I mean, the, the self-improvement from within. But this is, I think, not what actually happened. What actually happened is that the, the, the German situation needs to be situated in a European and even global context. So many of the debates about the German past, they were premised upon the United States occupation, upon, you know, pressures by the Jewish Claims Conference, by the presence of East Germany and, and, and Eastern Europe, by the European integration process. All of this made it almost impossible for Germany not to, in some ways, reckon or come to terms with the past. So I think, if, in particular, if you, if you compare Germany and East Asia, then I think you have a crucial difference here, right? For, in, the, in the Japanese case, there was no, there was no you know, Asian integration like the EU in, in, in Japan. Essentially, Japan looked at, at the United States, and that was it. So it, it never looked to the countries where it had committed its atrocities. So there I see a huge difference between these two sides. So, so much of what looks as if this is a, you know, a, a, an enormous German success story is really uh, also to some extent an effect of that particular way in which Germany was part of, a, of an emerging sort of European uh, Union in the post-war period. Um, Right, so that was my attempt to answer your question. So what, what the other one was? <laughs> Whatever I want, okay. All right, that's a, that's a tough one. Well, I, maybe uh, <laughs> just one thought would be, if we think, if we think at, back at the 20th century from the present uh, conjuncture, then I, I think what is striking is also the extent to which the 20th century was a universalist century. In, particularly after, uh, in particular after, after 1945. So essentially, um, you know, around the world, there was the idea that, it's sort of a shared idea that uh, in some ways, you know, it was a shared idea of, of, of development. And that included in some ways, across the divide of the Cold War, sort of the developmentalist states in the socialist world as it did the, you know, the, the sort of modernization theory informed states in the capitalist world. And in, in, in some ways it also informed the logics of, 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 of the Bandung states, like the you know, Neruvian development project and so forth. So <clears throat> up until the 1990s, we essentially lived in a universalist world. And since then, uh, we've seen the reemergence of strong regions that where, where, where scholars and intellectuals and politicians emphasize civilizational difference, right? That is really sort of a new phenomenon in the 21st century. And it's, it's clearly one of the, the questions that will remain with us, what that actually means. To what extent are these claims to particularity, say, you know, politics in China means something else than elsewhere, or philosophy in Africa is different from the rest of the world. To what extent these kinds of claims will actually transform the world we live in, uh, or to what extent they are just means or instruments to clamor for a hearing for particular claims. I mean, that, that I think will be one of the challenges um, for us to understand. Thank you. Nick, we have microphones. So if you'd like to ask a question, uh, uh, please raise your hand. I can see people want to ask a question. So the woman in the front here, sort of in the front. If you could identify yourselves, keep the questions brief, we'd appreciate it. Comments are also welcome as long as they're brief. Right, so um, my name is Nora Fishonar. I'm at the Institute of Middle Eastern Studies at George Washington University. And I thank you for an extremely stimulating panel. Um, I look forward to the book. Uh, I, my question has to do um, a bit with the broader framing of the project um, and then picking up at the end on uh, this question of memory work and contesting memory claims for the present. Um, so you all embed your analysis in the framework of 20th century global modernities. 
Um, and so it's a pluralistic framework, but at the same time, you're talking about modernity, one way or another. And modernity has certain basic assumptions about the way economic systems are going to work, about the way political systems are going to work, might be more or less inclusive, um, more or less a violent process in terms of establishing those institutions. But as has been pointed out multiple times on the panel, um, it ultimately seems to come down in the success cases that are highlighted here to um, some sort of establishment <laughs> Uh, of a nation state uh, out of extremely diverse uh, social, ethnic, religious uh, fabrics. Um, and, you know, parenthetically, if the United States experience in the 20th century has been somewhat less bloody, um, that's because all of the dirty work was done in the 19th century, right? So, uh, so I mean, I think um, when this question of the Arab world's exceptionalism comes up, um, and when this question of historical analogies comes up, um, I wanted to ask uh, what you think about uh, a set of tropes that are kind of raised a lot um, in this town when you look at the Arab uprisings or you look at the, uh, the sort of the general turmoil in the region right now. People say, well, this is their wars of religion, um, or this is their uh, revolutions of 1848, um, or this is and any number of sort of historical metaphors about the painful process and transition to modernity that Turkey, China, the US, uh, uh, Japan and Germany and so forth um, lived are invoked in, to, in order to explain what's happening in the Arab world right now. And is this misleading for us? And what are the, uh, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages of such metaphors? Very interesting. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Thanks. That's a great question. Even though, I mean, it, it, it's kind of awkward to see German's 20th century trajectory as a success story. That would be. That would be hard to argue, actually, right? So, I mean, we have a understanding of what, of what success means if we say something like that. But I think that's a very good question. Uh, and, and, and my answer to this would be the following. <clears throat> the, these modernities, you're absolutely right. It is, it is a pluralization of modernity, and we, we, we have plural, multiple claims on modernity. We no longer have a quest for alternatives to modernity. We don't see that hardly, maybe the Taliban, but essentially we look at <coughs> claims to sometimes radically culturally different modernities, but modernities nevertheless. So that is, that's one. Uh, but these historical analogies, I think, are misleading in the sense that they are, they are temporal anal analogies and not geographical analogies, if you know what I mean. So, <clears throat> so they assume there's, there's one essential trajectory that we need to follow. And some are a little behind, so they have their 1848, and they have their, you know, their French Revolution is still yet, is yet to come, and so forth. But what actually happens is that modern, I, I, would, st I would stick to the, to the term modern, the modern world, but I wouldn't see it as, an, as a temporal unfolding that every society needs to go through. But in fact, I would see it as a, as a global conjuncture. So the differences are not time lags, but the differences are defined by, let's say, the hierarchies or the unevenness of the sort of global geopolitical setting in which they unfold. So yes, we have differences between different places, but not because one is earlier or later or latecomer and so forth, but because under the, <clears throat> under the hierarchies of the present system, they are shaped by these asymmetries. So that's how I think we need to think about it. So yes, it's uneven. These modernities are uneven. But they're, if you will, uneven in space, synchronically, but not diachronically. Um, thank you, Nora, for the, for the question. My, the way I see it is that, that during the post-colonial period in the Cold <coughs> War, there is a lot of reflections on conditions of modernity that fits into this Arnold Toynbee framework in the sense that Arnold Toynbee will travel all around the world and he's also the most read historian. And the people who are reading Arnold Toynbee from Japan to Turkey <coughs> are not really challenging the international order, but they're reflecting on, is, like, is everything perfect? Could we just be, um, have anxiety about the modern condition? What contributions can be made from our own civilizational legacy? And there's something benign about this. I mean, those people from Turkey to Pakistan to other people who were reflecting on modernity and their religious traditions, they did not expect or predict the Iranian Revolution, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, or the Arab-Israeli wars. So I initially separate the kind of critiques of modernity in this peak time of modernity <laughs> in 60s, 70s, 80s from the geopolitical crisis. Um, 
But what does happen, I think, with Satoshi and I will work on this, is that you know, once Camp David, you know, God bless, and Mercedat, you know, if you could have just solved the Palestinian problem at the moment too, or Iranian revolution, other wars, you know, Saddam Hussein, Iran, Iraq war, Afghanistan, once these things happen, then there are actors and, and, and groups who kind of mobilize that critique of modernity from an Islamic universalist perspective with their geopolitical narratives that the West failed, the international order failed. But these are small groups, in, and I think eventually the America's invasion of Iraq and, and other things kind of cause, created the conditions for these small groups to be something. Otherwise, they would have disappeared some, in, in some ways. Just add, add a couple, couple of thoughts on that, it, uh, and we had a discussion on, on this earlier. Is, is, if we think of some of the, you know, primary tenets of modernity, and this is not going to be an exhaustive definition, but you know, some sort of belief in historical progress, some sort of uh, belief in rationality uh, and reason, uh, and empiricism, some sort of belief that the main organizing principles of the world are going to be the individual person and then the nation state, um, as opposed to just nationalism or tribalism or, or religious identity, and then uh, some sort of emphasis on sort of the material basis of, of human life. Um, seems to me that a lot of the tensions and fissures we have uh, in conflicts around the world are, uh, some are just an out and out revolt against modernity. I think that's mostly what the Islamic State is doing, although with a few modifications. Uh, others, such as Putinism, which we've talked about some, how do we classify this? Um, in some ways he's uh, hyper-modern, in other ways he's uh, a 19th century imperial romantic, right? And trying to appeal to more, um, <clears throat> more you know, visceral uh, uh, tri tribal uh, nationalistic impulses. And so uh, this is where I think, you know, Sebastian put it best that, there's, best that there's this multiple modernities out there and they're being very contested. And that's one way to understand a lot of the fault lines in the conflicts. Okay, um, I saw their hands up, and yes, ma'am, right here with the blue jacket. Uh, Professor Joanne Chen from Academic Seneca, Taipei, Taiwan. I have a question for Professor Chen. And uh, to what extent you think Taiwan will help shape the long process of Taiwan's right uh, of China's rise? And Taiwan has been considered as the success story of twenty century, and then now, uh, 21st century. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very, let me be very brief. Yes, indeed, Taiwan already has played an extremely important role in shaping the Chinese story. And if the Chinese Civil War ended with the communist forces occupying Taiwan, and Taiwan would not be serving as a contrasting example uh, to show to what extent modernity should and can be defined. Indeed, this is extremely important, especially, you know, this Chinese notion, Taiwan being part of China. And that is also continuously placing, placing a role because many say the Chinese cannot do democracy because Chinese uh, civilization is not necessarily compatible with uh, democracy. Let me ask, isn't the truth that Taiwanese are Chinese? If that was the case, it is the case. How can you say that, um, let's say, if Taiwanese can do democracy, and if they are Chinese, why cannot a Chinese do democracy? So yes, Taiwan is playing an extremely important and a positive role in shaping Chinese experience in, in, in the past, now, and also, I believe, in the future. Josh, right here. Thank you, Josh Walker, German Marshall Fund. It's great to see so many friends up on stage together. So I want to ask the obvious DC question, the so what question, right? Uh, you guys have done amazing jobs in the five minutes you had. I cannot re wait to read the book. Uh, but like uh, Dr. Green over here, as a trained political scientist, we're always told to kind of ask to draw this out and to say, OK, if you had to give advice to the president right after this meeting, uh, based on your chapters, to say, why does this all matter? What, where does that come in? And let me just put a parenthetical. A lot of people in this town are talking about the next century, the 21st century, looking much more uh, like the 19th century, a, a world of empires and spheres of influence. The one country not represented in your your book is obviously Russia that acts the most like an empire. It seems that Putin has a penchant for being going back to the Tsar's day. So if you had to uh, sum up all your, your lessons from the 20th century to make sure the 21st century does not replicate the negative aspects, uh, where would that come down? Well, um, 
I, I took a little bit of a stab at this, Josh, in the chapter, which obviously I, I didn't share earlier, uh, although most of mine were more on the domestic politics, but I'll just try to toss out a few uh, Lessons, insights, suggestions, provocations, uh, what, what have you. Uh, the first is, uh, if the 20th century was a century of ideological conflict, um, uh, the need to recognize those and, and engage in that, engage in that battle of ideas. Uh, I, you know, to shift from the descriptive to the normative, I do at the end of the day think that democratic capitalism is, you know, by and large, all things considered, uh, certainly a better model of political and economic organization for peace and prosperity and stability and human flourishing in, in the world. And so, uh, you know, I think uh, we need to be a little more confident in, in asserting that while, while, you know, well, guarding against chauvinism or triumphalism or other sorts of uh, unpleasant isms. Um, uh, I think the second, what I really dug up in my uh, chapter is looking at is the importance of political leadership. I mean, I, mine is very much on, f focused on the presidency, obviously, but the president is in a constant uh, conversation with the American people and with the rest of the world. Uh, and needs to be reading uh, those political currents very well, speaking into what people's concerns are, and yet nudging them along to, to a better place. Uh, we can't get too far up front, uh, but also shouldn't be uh, too behind that either. And so, um, you know, again, it's a truism, but political leadership, I think, is a, is a significant, significant factor here. Uh, and then uh, another one is uh, paying careful attention to old-fashioned power politics and power quotients, um, I think. Uh, leverage and power should shape strategies. Should tell us uh, what resources are available uh, and what might be what might be a bridge a bridge too far. And related to that, I kept on coming back to the importance of alliances, uh, formal and informal partners, in, and um, you know informal partners and in, in, in for, formal alliances. Uh, and I think that is one of the uh, underappreciated success stories of the of the 20th century. And yet. Uh, you know, certainly from the American perspective, a lot of our uh, alliances now are coming under question on, on both sides of the Atlantic, both sides of the of, of the of the Pacific. But uh, I, you know, at the end of the day, um, I'm I'm an allies guy, and I, I think that uh, going going back to those, starting with those, is the best places for geopolitical analysis and, and better action. So the um, uh, the concluding chapter of the book is going to be written by John Henry, and it, it is to do exactly what uh, you said. And uh, after our break, he's going to have a dialogue with Zbigniew Brzezinski about this, some of the lessons. Um, one of the key things he's focusing on uh, is uh, global governance and institutions. Um, uh, the failure of uh, global governance and institutions in the first part of the 20th century was um, not necessarily because of the way those institutions were um, conceived, actually. It was because of failures in leadership, failures to maintain a balance of power, um, failures within countries and so forth. So that's one big lesson. Um, the multipolarity um, thing, um, we're returning to a 19th century uh, looking multipolarity. I was chastised on this by all the historians in the room this morning because that's what I argued is, uh, you know, that look, we're, 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 we're potentially moving towards multipolarity. And it was quickly pointed out by every historian in the room that um, the multipolarity in the, in the 20th century and in the 19th, in the first half of the 20th century and in the 19th century was a Eurocentric empire-based multipolarity. And the multipolarity we have today is not what Chinese scholars say. Chinese scholars say it's a global multipolarity. We have an Asian pole that China mostly owns, a European pole that's Germany or France or whoever's giving the US the hardest time that day, um, and a Russian pole. Um, and the Russian poll is based purely on Chinese ideological views. Russia is a declining power in reality. Um, that's the wrong multipolarity. I think the multipolarity we're talking about is regional. Uh, that within each region there's an emerging multipolarity. Um, in, in Asia, not just Japan, but India. Uh, uh, of course, Japan and so forth. Within the Middle East, you have a multipolarity emerging. Um, and even arguably in Europe. And so the strategic challenges for the, for the president is to understand um, regional strategies and regional multipolarities, but also, um, I think, how to, um, how to preserve and strengthen the global governance that I started with and that John Hamry's focused on and, um, uh, and prevent regional um, rivalries and multipolarities from leading into a new form of 21st century chaos Part of that's regional, but part of that is, is integrating uh, players and new players into a, global, into a global system of institutions and rules and norms, none of which, none of the major powers are challenging the, the, the prevailing 
global um, uh, set of norms and rules, where China exhibits revisionist behavior is primarily in Asia, which, for example, which is not surprising because rising powers, including the US, Germany, usually are revisionist regionally while free riding globally. So we're not at a stage in history where anyone other than anti or pre-modernists like the Taliban or ISIS are challenging uh, global institutions in a fundamental way, offering a fundamentally different uh, vision. It's all about positioning and influence. Um, and, and for that reason, I think part of the president's job is to, um, is to find ways to continue um, demonstrating the, the, um, the, 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 not only the legitimacy, but the, the value of, 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 of nation states that want to be strong nation states um, adhering to these norms. That's why China joined the WTO to become a stronger state. And it's why Turkey wants to join the EU. So uh, I think one lesson might be that nation states are still very important, but for global governance to work, you have to design these institutions in ways that clearly reinforce the strength of nation states and the legitimacy of nation states. And part of that is understanding the very different narratives about history and legitimacy of these institutions that have emerged from the 20th century. So um, very good questions, thank you. We're gonna take um, a 15 minute break. There's coffee, there are drinks. I think you can accost our historians individually if you like. And then at um, four o'clock, Dr. Brzezinski will come in and we'll wrap up with, with um, some discussion about where this takes us all. Thank you all.